Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, d'un mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, d'un mon jardin d'hiver. A director Ray, Chairman Nunez's memo included sensitive FISA information regarding a person who worked on the president's campaign. According to the White House statement, the president was the one who authorized the memo's declassification. Do you believe there is an actual, or at least the appearance of a conflict of interest? when the president is put in charge of declassifying information that could complicate an ongoing investigation into his own campaign. Well, Senator, uh, as we've been very clear what our view was about the disclosure uh, and accuracy of the memo in question, but I do think it's the president's role as commander in chief uh, under the rule uh, that was invoked to um, to object or not to the declassification. So I think that, you know, that is the president's responsibility. Regardless of whether there is an appearance or actual conflict of interest. Well, I, I leave it to others to characterize whether there's an appearance or actual conflict of interest, but I, I think the president was fulfilling his responsibility in that situation. If the president asked you tomorrow to um, hand over to him additional sensitive FBI information on the investigations into his campaign, would you give it to him? Uh, I, I'm not going to discuss the uh, investigation uh, in question with the president, or much less provide information from that investigation to him. And if he wanted, if he received that information and then wanted to declassify it, would he have the ability to do that from your perspective? Information from the... However he received it, perhaps from members of the United States Congress. I think illegally he would have that ability. And uh, do you believe the president should recuse himself from reviewing and declassifying sensitive FBI material related to this investigation? I think recusal questions are something I would urge the president to talk to the White House counsel about. And has the FBI done any kind of legal analysis on these questions? Uh, well, happily, I'm, I'm no longer in the business of doing legal analysis. Um, I, now get to be a, I now get to be a client. Uh, uh, and blame lawyers for things instead of being the lawyer who gets blamed. So uh, we have, have not blamed done any analysis. lawyers for their analysis of this issue. What's that? Have you blamed any lawyers for their analysis of this I, I have not. It is Wednesday, the 14th of February of 2018, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Our daily special is Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Will no one rid me of this priest? Which uh, brings to mind it's Valentine's Day. You know, where this, uh, this fellow supposedly was incarcerated for a considerable amount of time and he penned love notes to his betrothed, or soon-to-be betrothed, or, I don't know, the unrequited love that uh, existed uh, outside the walls. At least that's the story we're told. Hmm. Like everything. Like uh, the cherry tree. And uh, Abe Lincoln walking 800,000 miles to return a book. 
You know, sometimes they're a little exaggerated, changed just a little bit. But I'll tell you, something that never changes is that whether it's Valentine's Day or any other day, you'll get nothing but hugs and kisses here at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Okay. Well, you'll get a little bit more than hugs and kisses, but you'll always get hugs and kisses because uh, I always like to tell people it's the Italian in me. But uh, my sister did one of those uh, Ancestry.com 23 and me uh, uh, DNA tests in a box. And uh, that uh, Italian ardor apparently is uh, much less of a percentage than uh, we had uh, originally thought that we were. Because apparently uh, we have a little bit more Romanian. Which I gotta tell you is really, really Italy anyway. But, you know borders change over time okay oh got a lot of irish apparently and uh um cornish i was wondering why i like those little cornish uh pocket bread things i love those don't you they're called pasties okay speaking of food donald trump who eats a quarter pounder with cheese you know what you know what they call a quarter pounder with cheese in paris Apparently, a royale with cheese. But I would think they would call it a royale uh, eat for homage. But I don't know. If, if you're making a movie, uh, you got to you know, you change things a little bit for poetic license so that the audience will understand. And certainly the accountants. They're the most important audience when making a movie anyway. Don't you know? Yes. So uh, this guy eats a quarter pounder Coke fries and now he wants to tell poor people what they should eat and none of it's fresh food isn't that weird it occurred to me that obama and michelle love fresh vegetables and fruit and that has to be a reason it was cut from snap i i i think since uh michelle put a garden in at the white house that may be deemed illegal in public schools now because it might be considered a, a violation of the separation between church and state. Because obviously putting in a garden is pagan. Especially if you plant nightshades. I've read the books, folks. I've read the books. Hey, speaking of what we'll have on the rest of the menu today. Oh, we started off Kamala Harris. Uh, I had a little argument with someone that's, well, not an argument, but a discussion, a disagreement. Where the premise was, who's Kamala Harris? Where's she coming from? Why are they trumpeting her? And, uh, you, know, you know. And of course, I've known Kamala Harris since uh, she was, even before she was a district attorney in San Francisco. I, so I was a bit shocked. I mean, come on, San Francisco. I mean, doesn't the rest of the world follow the minute machinations of what happens in San Francisco? I was shocked, apparently, when people don't. But that's uh, that's uh, sort of like your own xenophobia that you carry with you. And, uh, you know, the what was the term I used earlier? Ardor. Yes, the ardor for locale. What's on the rest of the menu? Well, oh, I wanted to mention Kamala Harris. Uh, put Might have put uh, the, uh, director, FBI Director Ray on the spot. Because should... Should Trump be recused from Trump Russia Intel? I mean, we're not talking about, you know, Intel of like Russia wanting to nuke us. I mean, he can get shared that information, I would think. But shouldn't he be be precluded from seeing the intelligence on the investigation of him? My God. Not to, uh, you know, bridge that wall of church and state too much there, but my God. Uh, I thought, you know, all the same players from Watergate who could not stand the idea that the president is not above the law. How dare he? Because they were all royalists anyway, embedded here to destroy our great experiment. I mean, that could be true. It's a long-term strategy and has worked before. 
Okay, what's on the rest of the menu? Prosecutors are joining the fight against Trump by running for Congress. Good thing. A Florida Democrat flips a Trump district blue in a stunning win. Yes, and a Minnesota mayoral candidate gets anti-Muslim death threats from the militia movement. You know, there's a report that just came out that the number one uh, terrorist uh, threat to the loss of life, limb, etc. Oh, and m- most importantly, property is is done by white extremists. They're the number one murderers. And destruction of the most important thing in our construct of living here in America, and that's property. Okay, but Once you start doing the property thing, which, as an aside, it occurs to me maybe this Rob Porter thing blew up because wives, chattel, property. You know, once you start de- you know dealing with property, they don't like it. And and as much as I hate to admit and admit, I can't accept that women are chattel, but I can accept that those people over there do, and they wield the power right now. My God. Okay, after the break. Of course, we'll move to the chef's table, where an ICE lawyer in Seattle is charged with stealing immigrants' identities to defraud credit card companies. Yes. Now, way back when the Department of Homeland Security, Z-Guile, was first put into place, it sure sounded like something that came out of a I don't know, a teutonic lust for power, I, I guess. What? How else could you put it? That th- there was something very untoward. It just felt wrong. It didn't feel American. And then the idea of ICE being part of, you know, the, uh, the SS, the, the, you know, a Gestapo almost. We, we, we all joke, like, what could go wrong? And then someone said, forget all that Teutonic stuff. What about somebody getting in there and stealing people's identities to defraud banks and credit card companies? Once again, once you start dealing with property, you know, if humans are property, something will be done. But, my God. <laughs> when, you, when you defraud a bank and, and a credit card company, you just, the hammer is coming down. Oh, and the Federal Reserve is now using the big stick on Wells Fargo in the latest chapter of the bank's self-destruction. No more little sticks with Wells Fargo. They brought in the big stick. And senators on the Intel Committee voiced concerns over China trying to gain access to sensitive U.S. technologies and intellectual properties. Oh, my, oh my God. My God, we've got a cyber war on two fronts. Whatever shall we do? All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Go to the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. You'll notice the chat room link at the right-ish of the page. To the left-ish of the page are the contribute donate buttons. That, I know it sounds like a broken record, but it is truly how we pay our bills, and we are unable to do that without you. And your generosity keeps this this endeavor uh, floating in the sea of uh, uncertainty with a, a little bit of calm every now and then, a little bit of port of refuge we can be the port of refuge i guess okay enough of that and uh podcasts of uh west coast cookbook and speakeasy as well as the justice department music sans frontier can be had by way of spreaker and i put links up on that on uh, various social media platforms and which reminds me you can uh you can reach uh netroots radio at 
Netroots Radio on Twitter, and we're on Facebook too, as Netroots Radio. Um, I believe Kelly takes care of the chat room and the Facebook page for the most part, and uh, another one of the crew who's responsible for the graphics and the wonderful looking uh, homepage that we have, and other things. Uh, takes care of, um, well, the man behind the curtain at the Twitter feed. I can be found as Justice Putnam on Daily Co's and at Justice Putnam on Twitter, so contact me there. Okay, oh, you can find links to show notes and all sorts of great information at the diary I put up daily uh, for the shows. So uh, I'll go check that out and uh, get the full um the full multimedia experience. Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, let's see. We ought to get into these uh, stories. Otherwise, time will just fritter away as it always does. And uh, prosecutors are a little upset with uh, Trump going after law enforcement because, you know. <laughs> okay, I, I, I never thought the whole law and order crowd really believed in it. Because they never believed in law and order for themselves. As long as they were making the law, they made the order. And if you didn't follow the order, you weren't following the law. And so, therefore, you're a dirty hippie. Or, you know, the N-word. Or, uh, you know, a a derogatory racial term for being Hispanic of, of any nationality. As long as it's Hispanic. Or any other there was there was a pejorative for anybody who was deemed the other. Okay, so I never, yeah, I never really believed that they were, you know, for America. It it served their purposes to wrap themselves up in the flag. Otherwise, they wouldn't be needing to wrap themselves up in the flag. It, it, it was the old Shakespearean. I don't think they protesteth too much. When you call yourself the silent majority, that's proof that you are anything but silent. And I got to tell you, the loudest whiners were the people that call themselves a silent majority. They just would never shut up. Silent majority. The silent majority were all those people in the middle of America. And I don't mean geographically, necessarily. But I mean over the spectrum of what it is that we are as Americans. The middle of that. The ones who are hunkered down, just trying to make ends meet. They've got kids to deal with. They, you know, they're, the paint is chipping off of the eaves. They've got to get that done before the weather changes. When they woke up and found out, because, you know, God, I thought, I thought Chad was going to come back here and help me paint these eaves, and now he's dead in that Vietnam. When that happened and people started waking up to their sons and, yes, daughters were dying in, you know, mass quantities, that changed. That was a silent majority. All right. Well, prosecutors are trying to unseat Republicans who are playing defense for Trump. This is uh, by Eric Bullard out of Share Blue Media. Tired of the wild, reckless, and partisan attacks that Trump and Republicans have been hurling against the FBI. A string of former prosecutors have come forward to run for Congress in hopes of unseating members of the GOP this year. Okay, this year. One such candidate is Chris Hunter, a former FBI agent and federal prosecutor running in Florida's 12th District. Little uh, inside info, my my father, who, you know, he's, gosh, he's bumping 90 now, but he uh, is still considered to be a historian of some renown. And uh, in his, in his uh, army life, they, you know, because, you know, he was, you know, he's not the, the biggest physical specimen in the world. And the reason he got away from the farm in South Dakota is because, you know, his phys- physically, it wasn't made for him. So uh, as a young as a young guy, I mean, he got out of North Dakota State, I believe, when he was like 16 and he was already getting a doctorate by the time he was 20 at Stanford. So um, uh, in that foray of doing all that, of course, he he went through school on the GI Bill, you know, 
you should look into it. A great program. They should do it again. And um, first house that we lived in, GI Bill. Yeah. But uh, uh, so he, in the Army, uh, he was part of what the CIA became, the OSS. Now, I only mention this, and, and he didn't have, according to him, I mean, he might. He might have been a Mark Felt. He's not admitting it, but he might have been one of those. Who knows? But as far as we know, he just basically was stateside interviewing people for security clearances. You know, where you go to people's homes and their neighbors, their schools, their employment, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, for security clearances. Interesting, huh? Everything is connected. But he always said that uh, when the first Bush was running for office, the worst thing you can have is a CIA intelligence person running the political aspect of what our government is. It's probably a mistake. I remember him being actually quite, what was the term? Ardent. Yes, ardent about that. Okay, so uh, I don't know. He, he, I, I, I don't think those sentiments are shared towards the rank and file law enforcement, like an FBI agent necessarily. One doesn't necessarily think of the FBI agent as being part of intelligence, but they are. It's a little bit different. He, he was really speaking about CIA because their, their uh, information and what he, what he termed um, the raw intelligence can really um, bias people if they succumb to all that raw intelligence. And, uh, yeah, so here we are. <laughs> well, uh, the paper, let's see, the Wall Street Journal reports that after watching President Donald Trump fire former FBI Director James Comey, belittle Attorney General Jeff Sessions, and pardon Sheriff Joe Arpaio, among other events... Mr. Hunter said he decided to leave his job as a prosecutor in Tampa in December and run for Congress. Well, good. So the paper identified five prosecutors who are running for Congress as Democrats this year, but zero prosecutors who were running as Republicans. Maybe, maybe the landscape has changed to the point where the term Democrat isn't in people's minds also aligned with the devil, evil, the worst scourge that could happen to America. In fact, Democrats, liberals, black people, multiculturalism, all of that is American carnage and it must end. Maybe that the landscape has changed. Maybe the mindset has, has moved to, well, can we just get along and be neighbors and, you know, so, so that we can get the, the job done? Okay. I mean, I've got chipping paint in my eaves. So uh, good for good for Mr. Hunter, and uh, I wish him well. No, there is so much winning going on. Who would have known in another special election in a stunning victory in Florida's 72nd district? uh, Democratic attorney Margaret Good did quite well in besting GOP realtor James Buchanan. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. And that's a state house district and we need state houses. It's not just on the federal level that we we are. uh, uh, the blue wave. Okay. We need to get dog catchers. We need to fill the dog catcher position. Certainly zoning boards, planning commissions. It, it, it's just that uh, we, we need to. So um, when, when, see, I'm not necessarily adverse to having, you know, what you might consider one party running the wheels of government. Especially with Democrats. I mean, we can't get along with ourselves. It'll just be a check and balance by default. Come on. We've learned how to get along. Come to an agreement so we can fill the potholes. They 
they they can get to power, but they sure don't know how to fill the potholes. Well, uh, oh, on Monday night, too, let's remember that there was another important win. By retaining a key state Senate district and throwing the GLP majority into jeopardy there. So in, in the uh, uh, Florida 72nd State House, Republicans had a lot riding on that seat. Oh, I should mention that this is what I'm gleaning this uh, from Matthew Chapman, also out of Share Blue Media. And uh, so they had a lot riding on the seat. And it is a danger sign for the party's prospects in other races next fall. So including uh, holding on to the governorship and kick out Bill Nelson, who's a Democrat or Democratic senator. And they don't like him. So, uh, yeah, Buchanan said uh, this is going to set the tone. You can't get complacent. When 2018 comes up, it's important that we get a win here. And he lost. So the second special election in Florida to flip a Republican seat for Democrats since Trump took office. And uh, Florida's GOP troubles may only be getting started in the wake of Hurricane Maria. Over 130,000 Puerto Ricans have moved to the state, many of whom are furious at Trump for leaving their island to its fate and a new ballot initiative this fall could amend Florida's constitution to repeal major major voter disenfranchisement laws that the state's Republican governor has exploited for years. Well, the Sunshine State may finally get a ray of sunshine. Last offering here at the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Will no one rid me of this priest? (laughs) I think it's so apropos that it's Valentine's Day and it's Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Look into it. Okay, I'm telling you. Okay, so um, uh, this last one is by Travis Geddes out of Raw Story. Now, uh, uh, mayoral candidate of Rochester, Minnesota, Regina Mustafa, started receiving death threats the day that she announced her candidacy. Uh, an account called Militia Movement threatened to, quote, execute all Muslims in America in a response to uh, uh, on her on a post, uh, which she reported to police. She said it was more of a general threat to all Muslims. But since the person did take the time, she said, to search me out and leave this comment, I took it as a specific threat. You have to take any kind of threat seriously so that we have this on file that this did happen. And she said she's received a number of anti-Muslim messages since entering the mayoral race, although she said none of the others were as menacing as the threat she reported. However, uh, Mustafa received a previous threat in August on her YouTube YouTube account while running for Minnesota's first congressional district, uh, which said, tell Regina she is lower than a Jewish. Uh, wow, this is really sick. They wanted, you know, they, 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 they wanted to shoot her somewhere down there, which is very uh, reminiscent of what Duterte told his uh his uh, forces to do. Oh, my God. Okay, well, Mustafa said she won't let the the threats change her view of Minnesota or her hometown. 
I don't know. It will not make me give up the overall good nature that I know is represented in the people of Minnesota and the country as a whole. She said, I'll be more cautious going forward, but I'm not going to let it change or alter my course in the campaign. Well, you know, the terrorists win when we acquiesce to their demands. So, Regina is an American. Why? I don't get it. Well, I do get it. Well, Regina Mustafa running for mayor in Rochester, Minnesota. Let's uh, put her on our uh, radar list and follow her pr- progress. Let's uh, get now to our, our uh, break, and then we'll come back and go through the weather and finish up at the chef's table. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. Have you noticed that Donald Trump constantly prefaces his outlandish lies with such phrases as, to be honest with you, to tell the truth and believe me. Why? Because, like a snake oil salesman, he constantly needs to convince himself that he's speaking the truth in order to perform his next lie convincingly. The show must go on and on. In fact, he already ranks as the lyingest president in U.S. history. And that includes Nixon. Trump's biggest whopper is that he's an honest-to-God populist, standing up for America's hard-hit middle class against Wall Street, corporate lobbyists, and moneyed elites. This prevarication has duped many working stiffs into thinking he's their champion. The huckster doubled down on this lie in his inaugural address last year, pompously declaring the forgotten men and women of our country will be forgotten no longer. That's why a new straight-talking pamphlet by the watchdog group Public Citizen, is so important. It exposes the people's champion as a rank fraud who is pushed from day one to further enrich and empower corporate elites he had denounced as a candidate. Public Citizen's report documents with concise, easy-to-grasp specifics how Trump the faux populist has systematically sold out the working families whose votes he cynically swiped, handing our government to a cacistocracy of corporate plutocrats. This is Jim Hightower saying, it's not merely that he's an irredeemable liar, but that Trump himself is a lie. The Public Citizen expose is titled, Forgetting the Forgotten, 101 Ways Donald Trump Has Betrayed the Middle Class, and it drives the stake of truth through the heart of his populist pretensions. Don't just read it. Use it like a Thomas Paine pamphlet to spread the truth. To download a free copy, go to corporatepresidency.org slash forgotten. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is Scientific American's 60-Second Science. I'm Steve Mursky. Well, lots of people recognize that as humans get older, they tend to have less and less children. Trees do it the other way around. David Lindenmeyer. He studies conservation, landscape ecology, and biodiversity at the Australian National University College of Science in Canberra. On January 26th, he spoke to Scientific American Editor-in-Chief Maria Di Cristina when they were both at the World Economic Forum in Davos. What happens is that the older some of these really big old trees get, the more seeds they produce and the more germinants they're likely to have. So it's actually polar opposite of what we see with humans and most other animals. So really quite extraordinary. And how about the number of older trees that we have today? How does that look? Uh, that's It's right, quite a distressing situation because in many, many forests and woodland and other ecosystems around the world, populations of large old trees are declining very, very quickly. And this matters because a lot of biodiversity, a lot of carbon, a lot of key ecosystem processes associated with those really big old trees. Is there something we can do about this? 
Absolutely there is. We can make sure that we grow more forest, we can make sure we protect the big trees that we have now, and we can make sure that we don't do things that really put a lot of pressure on those trees uh, straight out, just cutting them down. We should not be cutting down really big old trees anymore. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky. Welcome to 60 Second Civics, the daily podcast of the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. American Indians govern themselves by their own tribal laws, treaties with the U.S. government, and by special laws passed by Congress. These laws did not recognize American Indians to be citizens of the United States. As a result, they did not have the right to vote. The first attempt to grant Native Americans citizenship came in 1887 when Congress passed the Dawes Act. The Dawes Act granted a tract of land and citizenship to those who were willing to give up their allegiance to their tribe. The law was strongly resented by most tribes. Finally, Congress passed a law in 1924 called the Indian Citizenship Act. This law fully recognized Native Americans as citizens of the United States. The law also gave Native Americans the right to vote in federal elections. That's all for today's podcast. The show's theme song is Complacent by Cheryl B. Englehart. You can find Cheryl online at cbemusic.com. 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. This is Solidarity News on Radio Labor. This is a Radio Labor special report recorded on Tuesday, February 13th, 2018. I'm Mark Belanger. February 13th is World Radio Day, a day set aside by the United Nations to celebrate the importance of radio, especially for developing countries. But it's also a day for unionists to remind ourselves that just in the past couple of months, the Internet has become a lonelier place for us. Two major labor radio networks in the United States have folded. Workers' Independent News Week in Review. I'm Doug Cunningham. For when, I'm Joanne Powers. With the Republican majority in the state Senate voting last week to make Wisconsin the 28th state in the nation. Workers' Independent News, WIN, was founded in the United States in 2001 by Dr. Frank Emspeck. It stopped broadcasting in November 2017. WIN was on the air for 15 years and featured union news about the labor movement around the U.S., One of its on-air journalists, Doug Cunningham, was with the service right from the start. Joanne Powers was another of Wynn's lead reporters. Wynn had tried to find a new home with several other media outlets, but was not successful. The other major union radio service that folded recently is The Union Edge. Charles Showalter was the lead interviewer and host for the service, working with producers and on-air reporters Brittany Sheets and Angela Bachman. Behind the scenes was engineer Lena Nellick. Oh, I'm Brittany Sheets, and I'm here with Angela Bachman today. It's always lovely to be here with you, Brittany. It seems fitting to me that we're <laughs> ending this on a high note. Also joining us for this last segment, we have Lena Nellick, an engineer with us. Thank you so much for being here. And if I could work the board, that'd be cool. See, oh, I'm still thank- screwing it up on the last day. <laughs> you know, one, one, one would think that I could learn how to speak before, you know, after 11 years. Yeah, of well, you know, we all, we all have our challenges. And, of course, Charles is here, too. So um, I'm really happy to have everyone here for this last send-off. We're going to rant a little bit more here. There's a couple more things we would like to just kind of hit on based on what everyone said today about our feelings of the labor movement and how I think we could improve it moving forward. And I know right. Lena's prepared a couple things. She's kind of our, yeah. our voice that doesn't often get heard from, right. but she's very outspoken, <laughs> let me tell <Okay>. you. <laughs> yeah, I'm usually behind the board. I'm, I help Angela out. Um, but um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how unions uh, protect like LGBT plus people, um, people like myself. Especially because I don't think a lot of people understand that when you're at will, you basically, uh, even if there's a company policy that's supposed to protect you, you really aren't protected. It's really hopeful to hope that the government would protect us, but the first thing we need to do is protect ourselves. And that's what we, I mean, forming a union, being protected by a union contract, it's a form of protecting ourselves. Um, Everybody else in the room except for me is a millennial. And, you know, my time is done when it comes to 
you know, unionization, so to speak. You guys have a whole working career in front of you, and that is important, especially if it's in a union. It's a sad day for union communications when our media outlets have to shut down for lack of support from the labor movement. We here at Radio Labor will miss working with all the folks at Workers Independent News and the Union Edge. Frank, Charles, Doug, Joanne, Brittany, Angela, Lena, thank you. You helped build labor movement. But despite the sad news, we should remember that there are other labor radio shows still keeping up the struggle. Asia Pacific Currents, broadcast by 3CR Radio in Melbourne, Australia. Dennis Grease at the Labor Exchange on KGNU in Denver, Colorado. The Rick Smith Show out of Pennsylvania. And the largest, Workers World Media Productions in South Africa. The rise of podcasting has produced shows such as Teamster Nation and Nurse Talk Radio in the U.S. and the Labor Knots program in British Columbia, Canada. Radio Labor has been broadcasting since January 2010. We produce daily newscasts about the issues and events of the international labor movement, longer feature programs which are available on our website, and activist podcasts in support of labor organizations such as the Global Unions. And that's it. International Labor News You Can Use. I'm Mark Belanger. Thank you for listening. And remember, it's all about global solidarity. From United Nations headquarters in New York, this is your World in Two Minutes. I'm your host, Luke Vargas, for Talk Media News. North Korea has invited the president of South Korea for an official state visit. That invitation was passed along to South Korean President Moon Jae-in by the sister of North Korean Supreme Leader Kim Jong-un over the weekend. It seems the Winter Olympics are sparking at least a temporary interest in political dialogue. Vice President Mike Pence, who'd previously said talks with North Korea were off the table unless the country agreed to give up its nuclear weapons program in advance, reportedly told the Washington Post the U.S. would be willing to sit down with North Korea so long as a maximum pressure campaign against the regime continues. Pence told reporter Josh Rogan that, quote, the maximum pressure campaign is going to continue and intensify, but if you want to talk, we'll talk. Rebuilding Iraq after the war on the Islamic State will cost at least $88 billion. That figure was announced during a reconstruction conference in Kuwait on Monday, where Iraq's government presented a list of more than 150 key projects that require funding. Countries are not expected to announce their donations until Tuesday, but one country has signaled in advance it does not plan on committing any money. State Department spokesperson... Heather Nauert. I'm not aware of any uh, announcements that we will be making. And the British royal family is declaring war on plastic, instructing its facilities across the Commonwealth to phase out plastic bottles and straws and focus more on recycling. That announcement follows Queen Elizabeth's involvement in a recent documentary by naturalist David Attenborough entitled Plastic Oceans. Conservationists say roughly half of the plastic used each year around the world is for single-use purposes, including plastic shopping bags, which have an average working life of just 15 minutes but take thousands of years to break down. For more global news headlines, visit TalkMediaNews.com. Thank you for uh, accompanying us back here to the chef's table. We've uh, broken down and cleaned up the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And uh, that being stated, we have right now a palate cleanser for you, which is weather from around the world. And we begin along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America. It is current, currently 34 degrees. We're going to be much cooler than yesterday. We're only going to be to 47, they say. 
I think we'll be much cooler. We did. Yesterday, we did bump close to 60. We got up around 57 to 58 here, uh, where I uh, live, in a little bit in elevation, or at elevation. Uh, winds are out of the east, uh, quite negligible, so I don't think we're going to be at 47, but maybe much cooler. There is an active winter weather advisory in the area. The passes uh, around uh, 1,500 feet. Uh, you need chains. So snow flurries there. We are certainly going to be getting quite a bit of rain, uh, which uh, whereupon uh, the winds will be shifting out of the west-northwest at 5 to 10 miles an hour. Air quality right now is good at 43 parts per million. Good if you don't have breathing problems. Brought on from years of smoking, Mom. Come on. Well, at least she quit decades and decades and decades ago, but it still hurt her. Uh, pressure is holding at 30.09 inches. Visibility is at 10 miles. And uh, humidity is at 80%. And that will be rising to 100 right soon. Quite a few cells in the area. All right, so now weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased, and these people live around the world. London is uh, 41 with rain showers. Paris is 39 and cloudy with a winter weather advisory of their own. Uh, Rome is 46 and sunny. Kiev is 25 and cloudy. Kabul is 38 degrees with light rain. Hong Kong, 59 and mostly cloudy. Tokyo is 47 and partly cloudy. Sydney, Australia, 70 degrees and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 46 degrees and sunny. And New York, New York is 40 degrees Fahrenheit and cloudy. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. And these people live around the world. First offering here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Smothered Benedict Wednesdays as our daily special, folks. Uh, you know, they th this this Gestapo agency that is both the DHS and uh, ICE uh, may be wielding a bit too much power with little accountability. This story is out of uh, uh, from the AP. By Gene Johnson, the chief counsel for U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement in Seattle has been charged with stealing immigrants' identities. Those crooks. Those criminals coming here to America. My God. Well, this fellow, Rafael Sanchez, resigned from the agency effective Monday, faces one count of aggravated identity theft, and another of wire fraud in a charging document filed Monday in U.S. District Court. Uh, prosecutors allege that Sanchez stole the identities of at least seven people in various stages of immigration proceedings to defraud credit card companies including American Express, Bank of America, and Capital One. What do you have in your wallet? Let me have it. I'll email the information to myself and use it for later. Okay, well, neither Sanchez nor his lawyer, Cassandra Stram, immediately returned emails seeking comment. Call him on the phone. I know it's hard to find out what the phone is, but, you know, you're the AP. All right, the charging document contained few specifics about the allegations, but did give one example. It said that in April of 2016, he did send an email to himself, uh... To his Yahoo account. No one uses Yahoo anymore. That included personal information pertaining to a Chinese national. And that information sent that uh, Sanchez had sent to himself included an image of uh, the Chinese national uh, who was a U.S. permanent resident. That card, he 
emailed him a picture of that the biographical page of the Nationals Chinese passport passport and a utility bill in his name. Okay, well, that's one way to supplement your income, isn't it? Going to jail. Okay, I guess they're picking uh, what the best and the brightest. Next offering here at the Chef's Table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is by Joseph DiStefano from the Philadelphia Inquirer. Remember Robert Morris, the founding father? He saved George Washington's army by making military supply profitable, started America's first central bank, turned down Washington's offer to be Treasury Secretary. He let Alexander Hamilton do it, of course. Then went off to speculate in Pocono's real estate. And what's so broke that he landed in jail. That's why bankers have all those regulations. As bright as they are, when left alone, they tend to wreck themselves and take others with them. Banks still find new ways to fail. Wells Fargo and Company, whose 6,000 branches form the largest bank network in the U.S., has in recent years boasted of steady, magical growth, even when the rest of the industry was having a tough time getting customers to borrow, save, and invest. It's five years now since reporters at the LA Times began exposing Wells Fargo's boasted growth as a product of perverse incentives and phony accounts, fat legal settlements, mass firings, management resignations and force outs, and public embarrassment in Congress culminated earlier this month with a regulatory slapping by departing Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen. Her replacement, Jerome Powell, and their Fed colleagues, who voted to ban Wells Fargo from growing its way out of its troubles until it shows that it can follow the law. What went wrong? Wells Fargo descends from the old Northwestern Bank of Minneapolis, a bank so good and careful that it stayed open through the Great Depression and kept smaller banks from failing. The old Norwest went nuts in the merger mania in the last 25 years, buying the remains of many other banks, including Wells Fargo, whose California name and headquarters it took over so it could escape those lousy Minneapolis winners. And they also bought First Union, which had ingested the biggest banks in Philadelphia. Well, it made sense to burn those billions by buying 6,000 branches. If you didn't see the Internet and smartphones coming, you had to. Okay, But with fewer walk-in customers, Wells Fargo had to find new ways to make money. Yeah, well, you would open those branches if you didn't think people were going to be doing uh, banking by smartphone. Other bank branches closed, uh, but former Wells Fargo CEO John Strump's lieutenants came up with a scheme to pay branch workers to open more accounts and pay bonuses uh, or and pay their bosses fat bonuses to make sure they did. Well, what happened next would have been obvious to anyone but an overpaid bank executive. Thousands of low-paid Wells Fargo employees illegally registered phony accounts for their unsuspecting neighbors, the kids on junior soccer team, and some w- woman who cashed her paychecks at the branch. Thousands were caught and fired, but Wells Fargo did not change the system, so new workers kept doing the same thing. In the uproar, once all this deceit became public, uh, Stump stepped down. The company was fined a few billion dollars, and a couple of bosses even had to give back part of their multi-million dollar bonuses. And then Yellen piled on, calling Wells Fargo's misconduct pervasive and persistent. In its order on February the 2nd, the Fed especially targeted, besides ex-CEO Stump, Stephen Sanger, retired boss at Cheerios maker General Mills, who was made board chairman as a step toward damage control, damage control, even though Sanger had been one of the well-paid directors asleep at the switch for years. 
And he was paid 486000 bucks in cash and stock for going to meetings in 2016 alone. Well, the pair were singled out because they did not meet the Federal Reserve's expectations. Okay, other prominent and well-connected Wells Fargo board members from the Frontiers, including Elaine Chow, yeah, and Frederica, Frederico Pena, who are the current and former U.S. Secretaries of Transportation, were not singled out like their leader Sager in the Fed report, but make no mistake, if the Wells Fargo board failed Washington and America, it was an inside job. Okay, so... Uh, so this time, the Fed applied what passes in Washington for a big stick. Wells Fargo is not allowed to add net loans or investment without the Fed's written permission. The company has to cooperate with any ongoing investigations uh, of whether separate enforcement actions should be taken against Wells Fargo executive board members and employees. Well, Wall Street did not applaud. Analysts like KBW's Brian Kleinhansel or Klein, Klein Hansel, predicted the bank would lose more money in market share. Wells Fargo shares plunged faster than other stocks in recent in the recent market freeze. So the Fed slap ought to force Wells Fargo to set up a model board and ex- excellent ethical practices for a while. Meanwhile, more of those 6,000 branches are being found unprofitable and shutting down, although Wells Fargo has raised pay for the surviving branch staff. Nobody is predicting this is the end of banker self-destruction. Just keep watching these guys. Like uh, Senator Richard Burr, is, uh, of course, chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, is very worried about the spread in the United States of what he called counterintelligence and information security risks that come prepackaged with the goods and services of certain overseas vendors. This is out of Reuters by uh, uh, Patricia Zengarelli and Doina Shisau. Uh, I presume what he's talking about are actual products that you can buy that have embedded in them certain uh, software code that uh, can infect or take over your computer or uh, follow you and uh, your keystrokes and all sorts of different types of things. So, uh, and it says some of these Chinese tech companies may not even have to acquire an American company before they become pervasive in our markets, Warner said. He's the uh, ranking member, the minority member on the intelligence uh, committee. Chinese technology firms have come under greater government scrutiny in the U.S. in recent years over fears they may be conduits for spying and something they have consistently denied. How inscrutable, as they used to say. Burr said he worried, worried that foreign commercial investment and acquisitions might jeopardize sensitive technologies and that U.S. academic research and laboratories may be at risk of infiltration by China spies. Okay, well, they're on it. And remember, Burr is the Republican. And it sounds to me like his hair is on fire. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But do stay uh, tuned to the rest of uh, Netroots Radio programming, always breaking news, and you'll hear it here. And follow up, of course, and we will visit with you tomorrow for Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. So do join us then. Tomorrow in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des 
Et un tel été Des photos de bord de mer Demain jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Demain jardin d'hiver Du frais d'Aster, revoir un latte coël. Je voudrais toujours te plaire dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je veux déjeuner par terre, comme au long de golf clair. T'embrasser les yeux ouverts dans mon jardin d'hiver. Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 